Well, we have a treat here tonight, Chad Willardson. He is the founder and president of Pacific Capital. Uh, he's elected to city treasurer for his city, managing $350 million portfolio. Uh, that's that's an insane number. You must be obviously living in a bigger place than I am. Um, I don't know <laughs> if you're aware of this. I'm near Fargo, North Dakota. Oh, so, wow. So yeah. you might even hear it in my accent. But, uh, but what I really wanted to focus on is that you have a book that is going to be released tomorrow, and people can find it hopefully when they hear this show. Um, and it's called Stress-Free Money, Overcome the Seven Obstacles to Find Financial Freedom. Um, yes. So everybody should check that out right away. But, um, and I understand that, uh, first of all, you prefer contacting, you know, if people want to reach out, they can e easily find you on LinkedIn. Yeah. And uh, yep. through your website, if they want to chat directly called goals con goalsconversation.com, right? That's right. Yeah. Goalsconversation.com. Schedule a time to chat about your goals. No cost, no obligation. So happy to talk and see if we can find a way to give you some good advice. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time here tonight. And uh, I think we're going to delve into some things that, you know, we, we're really into uh, the transactional real estate market. You know, everybody right. that listens to our show is either wholesaling, buy and holds in a variety of categories. But um, what I really wanted to dive into here today is talking about why we do what we do and some of these obstacles that you bring up in your, in your book. You know, that's a, that's a great question. We talk about financial goals with people and whether they're in real estate or whatever business or investment vehicle they like to use. I always like to add the phrase so that dot, 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 you know, so mm -hmm. I said, like, what's your goal? Well, my goal is to have, you know, 300 doors. I want to have an investment portfolio of multifamily and single family residents and this and that. And I want to be making this much in passive income a month. And I like to ask that question at that moment, which is so that what, you know, let's find the, let's find the purpose and the meaning behind your financial goals. And I think that's where we discover a lot of what's driving you. So if you say, so that, so that I can send my three kids to any college they get into, or so that I can uh, provide the travel experiences for my family that we never had. So I, I, f I do feel like the goals and the, uh, you know, the purpose behind what you're doing in real estate does matter. It, it does give you that purpose that can guide some of the investment strategy that you're going after. No, I, I, I can't agree with you more. I mean, and, and, and it's typically that exercise that could possibly give you that proper motivation to keep the, keep the wheels turning, right? Yep. hundred percent. If you, if you know why, then you're more motivated. You, you've attached purpose to that investment deal or to that dollar amount. Um, a lot of times people just, it's like, imagine you're, you're shooting archery, you know, bow and arrow and you go out into the forest and there's no targets, there's no goals, there's no purpose. You're just kind of shooting into the wind shooting into the forest, you don't have really something to aim at and a purpose, a purpose and goals based planning gives you something to aim at. And like you said, we'll give you a lot more motivation to actually achieve or reach those goals. You know, when you when you say going through this exercise, you know, so that, you know, dot, 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 do you advise people to um, maybe even write that down? Or like, how far do you suggest they go into that exercise? If you don't write it down, I don't think it counts. So that's a hundred percent. Yes. You know, less than 3% of people have written uh, goals and, and those people are the ones who are the most financial. I mean, at our Pacific capital where we are a fiduciary, a financial fiduciary and we have a, we have a unique and trademark process called the financial life inspection. And that financial life inspection is the process of going through a full diagnostic, almost like a, an appraisal for your house or a car diagnostic. And at the end of it, we're going to have some very clear written goals once we've completed your financial life inspection. So we're going to know the financials of it and we're going to know the purpose and the goals behind it, which I think when you have the combination of those two and it's in writing, 
And if you're married, it includes your spouse and the conversations. I think, like you said, it's a game changer as far as helping you get on the path to actually succeed. Yeah. So, you know, and, and when you go through that exercise as well, I would imagine that it's going to probably guide your strategies when it comes to investing. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. We, we like to remind people that um, successful investing is goal focused and planning driven. So the goals and the plans come first and that determines the investment strategy. So it doesn't make sense to jump into the investment side before you have a goal and a plan. So I'm not going to do a bunch of uh, real estate flips if our goal is something that's long-term steady passive income. Those don't match up. So we want to we want to align people's investment strategy with the purpose and the goals behind it. The life stage, the risk comfort level, you know, the income and asset level, the debt the family situation. So we're going to look at that before we give any specific advice as, as to, you know, as into their strategy per se. So as people are trying to assess their, their investing goals, whether it's real estate or otherwise, can you talk a little bit about like some of those common mistakes that uh, people might make? Yes. Like one common mistake. It's funny. I just got off the phone with someone who was referred to us, he lives in um, Southern California and he's, he's got 99% of his financial net worth is in real estate. And the 1% that he has sitting at the bank at Wells Fargo, it's, it's a significant amount. And he's like, I think I should buy another property, but something tells me I need something liquid paying me some income. And so I, I think the, one of the challenges I see besides not having clear goals up front would be people are over investing and over concentrated in just one category. Hmm. So, you know, in your case for real estate investors, if you just love, you, you bought a couple single family residences and you're really excited about that one category. And so that's what you stick with and that's all you ever do. Hmm. Um, it makes a lot more sense to be diversified. And so the analogy I like to use is if you're going to plant trees and fruit trees for 30 years from now, you want to plant a different variety of trees. You don't want to have 25 apple trees and that's all you've got. You know, you want to have crops and fruits in different seasons. And sometimes certain investment categories are doing well and other times it's not doing so well, but that's why that diversity and variety will pay off in the long run. Yeah. You know, and, and what I what I think is really uh, interesting is, is that usually when you're trying to diversify, you need some additional help. You know, when, we've been talking about when it comes to real estate investing, you should be building your network. And when you're not comfortable doing something, you find somebody, you add somebody to your team that yeah. is skilled and comfortable in doing it. In this case, it's financial advisors, right? You know, we, yeah. we'd want to find somebody that we can add to that team that has that expertise. Unfortunately, I'm going to use your analogy with, with the mechanic. Right. Um, it's hard to find somebody you can know, like, and trust when it comes to this category. I mean, it's your fi finances. It's something that's very personal. It's something yep. that we're trying to establish. How do you, how would you advise somebody to, to find a good financial advisor? And this is perfect analogy because I don't know anything about cars and therefore I'm always worried I'm getting taken advantage of by the auto mechanic because I just, they could tell me all kinds of things are wrong and I have no idea. And I'm like, do I really need to replace that or do I not? Mm -hmm. And it's, it is kind of an overwhelming or intimidating or scary feeling for sure. Um, I will show the book since it did just come out. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the chapters is actually about financial salespeople. That's one of the seven obstacles I list in the book that people have got to learn how to see through. And it's uh, chapter four, biased advice from financial salespeople. I think that's one of the biggest challenges people face is that, like you said, number one, they don't know who to trust. And number two, they're used to being sold to or in a high pressure situation. 
you know, imagine going to the doctor and the doctor already has some pills that he's trying to give you off the mm-hmm. shelf. And he hasn't done any health diagnostic. You don't really know him well. You, you, there's no trust or comfort level. Unfortunately, that's, that's the case with many financial people out there. And that's why I think our industry has such a low trust factor. Um, I'd say if you're looking for an advisor to help you in, in your planning, number one, you should look for a fiduciary. So less than 5% of financial advisors are fiduciaries. That number is thankfully growing, but a fiduciary is someone who is independent, objective, they're legally bound to put your interest ahead of their own, even if it makes them less money. A fiduciary doesn't get paid investment commissions or anything like that. So you're gonna find a much different consulting relationship experience if you're working with a fiduciary than if you're working with someone who works at a big bank Mm -hmm. or a big insurance company where they're trying to sell and you know reach a quota make a quick commission and move on Um, that's not the those aren't the people that are going to help you plan for the long term so looking for a fiduciary looking for someone who's got credibility good reviews um, a fiduciary will be very transparent about their costs so they're right up front. You know exactly what you're paying. It should be a flat rate. Um, so I, I think that that's, to me, that's first and foremost. You need to make sure the incentives are aligned. A fiduciary does well if you do well. You know, a broker or an investment salesperson or an insurance agent, they just want to close a deal and get a get a paycheck. So it's a, it's a little bit different of a of a value proposition, I should say. You should also look for someone who has experience in what you are looking to get advice in, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You wouldn't go to a fitness trainer who's completely out of shape and never exercises and eats poorly. And yet I see many people go to financial advisors who they themselves are in no position to be giving financial advice. They haven't taken the advice. They don't eat their own cooking. as a business owner, like I own Pacific Capital. I, I left Merrill Lynch in 2011 and I started this business and I went through all the ups and downs and the challenges of starting and owning and growing and building a business. And for business owners, they really like knowing that I'm also a business owner. They like hearing about, you know, I invest in real estate. I have a lot of rental properties. I own a business. So clients who are like me, They really value my advice because I'm doing the same things I'm advising them on. Whereas if I was someone maybe just sitting in a cubicle at a bank, I'd be giving advice from theory, you know, or from a book I read. So I think you should find a fiduciary advisor who has done things that you want to accomplish or is doing them and can give you advice from their own experience. I think that matters. So that, it's interesting. You, How long were you at Merrill Lynch, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I was at Merrill Lynch for nine years. So, and what caused you to start your own? So I left and started Pacific Capital on 11-11-11. What a suspicious oh. there for good luck. <laughs> but I, I was so turned off by the bureaucracy and the, just the, I felt like I was in a tug of war. You know, my one arm was being pulled to please the, the bank managers and the, the higher up banker people at Merrill Lynch. And the other arm was being pulled by what the clients really needed most. Mm-hmm. And I, once I found myself in too many conflicts where I was like, okay, do I do what the higher up bosses want or do I kind of stiff arm the company and tell the clients what I really think? And when it got to that point, I just said, you know what, I have to leave. Like I can't. And to be, to be honest, I hope this isn't taken the wrong way, but I was in the top 2% in the country of all advisors at Merrill Lynch. So I was in a pretty high status level at that point when I left. So I, for a lot of people, it was shocking, but I just knew it was the right thing to do. I knew that if I could be a fiduciary, Um, I could be independent. I could look clients in the eyes every time and say, 
here are three options for you. Here are the pros and cons of all of them. And I don't get paid differently no matter what you do. I'm trying to give you the best advice that I would give my parents or my grandparents, you know? Mm -hmm. And so as soon as I realized I could do that in my mind and, you know, it became clear to me that it was possible, I left. And so we've been fortunate to grow significantly since 2011, but I, don't, I never look back with remorse for leaving at all. I mean, it's been a great thing for our clients and for us. Sure. You know, that, that's, that's really telling. I mean, if you're so confident and steadfast in what you think is right to, to start up an old, your own business to accomplish that goal, that's, that's commendable. Thank you. I look back and I think I was a little crazy and naive because it was nine years ago, I was 32 and I'm like, man, that's a, that was a big, scary move, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it's taking that action. You know, yeah. you're, you're, um, there's a lot of people who are, that we talk to on a regular basis that are trying to decide to get in that first rental property. Right. Um, and uh, frankly, you, you don't know what you don't know. And, and you, right. you, know, you, you kind of have to make that jump, right? Yes. I'll tell a story, quick story on what, how I got into real estate investing. Um, one of our clients, it's funny because I see all the things our clients do financially. So I learn a lot from them as well while we're advising them over the years. You know, it's been 19 years now, but we had a client in 2010, um, 2009, we bought our second house. It was a short sale, incredible deal. It took 11 months negotiating with the bank on the short sale. Crazy story. But so, I, so we owned a couple houses, but none of them were really investment houses. We had turned my first house into a rental, but a client just said, Hey, I bought this condo and I need to wire some money out of my account. And so we wired the money out and then we discussed the deal and the terms. And I realized I was like, wow, like that's, that's really how much rent you're getting versus the, the mortgage. And he said, yeah. I said, man, let me know if, if anything else pops up in that complex. And that was 2010. And sure enough, like a month later, there was a, someone was desperate to sell cause it was, you know, end of the recession. And so I bought one. And then it turned into a couple more. And then I started getting houses and um, multifamilies, duplexes and fourplexes. And it was like, I haven't invested in new properties in a while, in a few years, but I mean, I, it was, had I not been listening to that client's ideas and taking his advice, I would have probably, I don't know if I would have ever gotten started. So like you said, no. you just have to take that leap and get that first property and you realize, wow, there's, there's a lot of great opportunity out there. Well, you know, a lot of us have gotten into real estate investing because, you know, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yep. And yep. a big lesson and takeaway there is watching for opportunities and taking advantage yep. of them as they're presented. And, and that's exactly, it sounds like what you did and you pivoted at that moment and, and it, and it was a good fit. Absolutely. Yep. yep. So that's, that's a, that's remarkably, that's, that's a great skill, like to be able to pivot and identify an opportunity and go for it. Takes a little courage, but sometimes it, you just have to jump in, you know? Well, and exactly. You'll, and you'll, learn, you'll learn as you go. <laughs> so, well, I don't want you to give me all of your secrets from your book, but you gave us one already regarding how to pick a financial advisor. Are yeah. there any other little secrets or gold mines you can, you could possibly share. Yeah. Let me just, let me uh, tease the, the seven obstacles, which I made into chapters. So the first obstacle is no clear goals. So we talked about that a little bit. You've got to have mm -hmm. goals first. The second obstacle is financial fast food. Um, that really gets into what to consume and what not to consume when it comes to information out there. A lot of the financial entertainment news media. Oh, sure. Number three, we talk about focusing on the wrong number. Number four is the biased advice from financial salespeople. So we talked about that. Number five is the F word. And we don't, we don't swear in my house, but the F word is fees. So we talk about <laughs> how to really, how to, how to cut your costs when it comes to working with investment advisors or financial planners, whatever. Number six is taking on too much risk or not enough. That's something I see a lot of is people, 
people come in and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm really safe. I'm conservative. I don't want to do anything that's too high risk. And then their investments are extremely aggressive and risky. It's, it's totally opposite of what they think they are. Or vice versa, people are sitting in cash and they say they're a growth focused investor and they've got tons of money earning almost nothing. And they're like, well, I'm waiting for that opportunity. And so we'll take a look at how we can invest their money and then potentially utilize some portfolio lending and other things to get them into their real estate deals when the opportunities come up. Mm -hmm. And then number seven is letting your feelings get in the way. So that's, you know, we talk a lot about, I, I share a bunch of different examples of how emotions come into making financial decisions. And I think that's very important is when you have a third party fiduciary advisor on your team, they will help you see through your biases and your feelings and your fear, you know, your FOMO, your potential regret, all that, your greed sometimes, all that stuff. So mm -hmm. Uh, if you can remove your feelings from your financial decision making, you're going to be more successful. Yeah, I think that's a more of a struggle for people than they even realize. For sure. Yeah, they, they've got to recognize it first. So, so you know, I, I do want to remind people that, you know, we just covered those chapter highlights from your book. It's available probably now. Head yeah. over to Amazon to pick up, pick up a copy. Um, in fact, I, I noticed the uh, Kindle version is a pretty attractive uh, it is. price for the right first, now. For the first week, the Kindle is discounted to 99 cents. So yeah. no excuse not to pick that up. Yeah, that's, that's great. And uh, so with that, uh, we, we, we've covered quite a bit of ground here today. And I wanted to also remind people that if you wanted a deeper conversation with Chad, make sure to head over to Goals conversation.com or reach out, hit him up on LinkedIn. I, yeah. I, I, I noticed that you're pretty active on LinkedIn. Absolutely. So, so in the end, um, we, we talk about all of these things and, and everything that is really top of mind right now is the whole current economy, the environment with COVID, the election, this, yep. I mean, everything's going on right now. Yep. What do you think the market's going to look like at least short term in the next, I don't know, six, nine months? I mean, it just seems so unstable. <laughs> yeah, there's, it feels like there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, it feels like there's a lot of risk. And my honest answer is I have no idea. <laughs> that, that is my honest answer. And I will always give you an honest answer. But I do know a lot of things that people can do to prepare. Um, we stress test people's financial plans every day. When we do the financial life inspection, we're going to look for the risks and the gaps and the places where you're unprepared for a potential downturn, for a recession, for interest rates changing drastically, for inflation going up a lot, which could happen. You know, we've spent a lot of money as a government lately and inflation has been low. So inflation could go up a lot and we want to stress test what you're doing in your financial life and how that could impact you. So we know that we know the things that we can control and that's where we'll help you make an impact for the uncontrollables, the market, the interest rates, the GDP, the economy. Like I, I have an economics degree and I've got 20 years advising wealthy, successful people. I have no idea. <laughs> That's the honest truth. Anyone who tries to pretend to be a fortune teller, they probably have something to sell you. And those are, those are the people you should probably not take advice from. So no financial advisor knows what's going to happen to the markets. And uh, there's a lot of danger in predictions. So if anyone's saying, well, if Biden wins, this is what's going to happen. Or if Trump wins, this is what's going to happen. That's not true. Nobody knows. Um, interestingly enough, when you look at the data, the stock market is up between 8.1 and 8.9% during election years, regardless of who wins. So uh, there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of fear, but that's pretty common. I mean, the news media gets paid based on clicks and views. And so that's going to continue. It's whether it's 
you know, trade wars with China or some specific geopolitical risk, we can't control that stuff. So you need to be planning, preparing and investing, controlling what you can control. And that's all that matters. Yeah, we, we use this term on the show quite a bit that you need to maintain a persistent, consistent behavior when like it, it comes to real estate investing, yep. but when it comes to any kind of investing for that matter. So this is a perfect example of even though there might be a lot of turmoil going on, we need to, like you mentioned, remove our emotions, yep. just be consistent with our numbers, adjust yes. accordingly, and yep. just keep, keep moving forward, right? And, and you can't predict the financial stock markets. You can't predict real estate, but you can know that in 10 years, I'm going to be 10 years older. And so I need to be investing and preparing and being consistent no matter what, because that time's going to pass anyway. So anyone who says, oh, well, real estate's going to go down in the next three months. So I shouldn't buy now. I should just wait. I hear stuff like that all the time. And I'm like, well, where's your crystal ball? Because I, I've put a lot of time in this business and I don't have access to that crystal ball. You know, so it's unpredictable, but our behavior is completely predictable if we focus and if we're intentional. Sure. No, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I warned you, it was, we we're probably in a, in a blink of an eye. We've already spent a half an hour here. <laughs> yeah. um, before we wrap things up, or is there any question that you think we probably, I should have asked you here tonight? No, I, I think... Um, the only thing that comes to mind that I like to remind people is that I genuinely believe, uh, first of all, most people feel anxiety and stress about money. It's one mm -hmm. of the leading causes of divorce. It's, it's leads to bad health. I mean, it's a real thing, financial stress. And I believe that you can achieve that level of stress-free money, that, that relationship where you're not always worried about it, regardless of your income. So you don't need to keep thinking that if I just get a raise or if I just make a little bit more than once I'm there, I'll relax. You know, once mm -hmm. I make X, then I'll be happy. Then I'll, or I'll start doing some investing and planning once I get to X. That's not true. You can have success. You can have financial freedom. You can plan and prepare. I've seen people do it at many different income levels. Um, and so you, you don't need to wait. There's no good reason to procrastinate the prioritization of your financial life because money touches everything you do. So you've got to be, you've got to make sure you're square, especially if you've got a family or a business or other people that depend on you. I think it's even more important. So that's what I, that's what I wanted to end on. And I don't think we could end it on a better note. So um, just to wrap up a few things, you know, we, we, uh, I like to pull out a, a few things that we talked about in a, in a quick summary. Um, really like the, the fact that we focused on don't let your emotions drive your investments. Um, and, and that's a great way to get into trouble. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I really like that we talked about the fiduciary and finding that type of advisor. And I don't think a lot of people know enough about that as an option. We, we kind of lump all of the financial advisors in the same bucket. Yes. And those, those fiduciaries are really a great option. Um, I really like that you also talked about the, the opportunity of finding that advisor that has the experience in the type of investing you're trying to get into. Um, right. So uh, I, I think we, don't typically like to ask those type of questions for some reason. Mm -hmm. So we got to build that. It's, it's a relationship just like anything else. It's, it's not off limits. If you're going to date someone in a financial relationship, you've got to ask some tough questions. And then when you're visiting your goals regarding your investing, um, write it down. Otherwise it doesn't count. Doesn't count. <laughs> doesn't write it down. Count. Absolutely. So again, I can't thank you enough, but if you really want a deeper dive, first of all, definitely pick up the book at 99 cents for the Kindle edition. Take advantage. I mean, come on. It's a buck. Um, yep. Definitely head over to goalsconversation.com if you want a deeper conversation. Um, and uh, I, I think that exercise alone, well worth everybody's time. 
but uh, reach out to Chad on, on LinkedIn. Is there yeah. anything else, sir? No, that's it. I appreciate you having me on. I enjoyed it. I really appreciate your time. And it, this is just a great topic that I think we need to visit more often. So thanks for the, for the advice and guidance. My pleasure.